Thank you, Jackson. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Yin Burr. I'm a treasurer of this association and also a CAR director. This morning, we have a few CAR directors and a member who will share with you, uh, bring some information to you from the meetings we had in Sacramento and also in Washington, D.C. We were in Sacramento for the CARs, California Association of Realtors meetings, on April the 30th through May 3rd. And we were in Washington, D.C. on May the 12th to May the 17th. Right now, I'd like to have uh, Teresa Dang share with you some information that she had gathered from the YPN <coughs> meetings. Teresa? Good morning. I'm going to be reporting on the wide committee uh, committee report on a CAR level and also on the uh, Realtor Action Fund Committee. Uh, YPN, they're working on the YPN uh, Evolve Conference. This is held October 7th, which is a Tuesday. This is the first day of the CAR Expo. Uh, this is going to be our third annual this year, I believe. Uh, lunch will be provided again just like it did last year and the program will include practical applications, technology forum, and also motivational speakers. Those that did not attend last year, we had AC Green. Uh, he was a Laker and he gave a great motivational speech. We're hoping to have another speaker from the sports, um, some kind of sports league. We are also doing another uh, CAR YPN reception again. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the registration actually started yesterday. Early bird is $69 if you register by June 30th, 79 after and 99 on site. We also had an ethics panel. We want to encourage more of our members to uh, write up violations. I understand that some of our agents they feel a little intimidated because it can be a top producer who is being unethical and um, acting this way and i know that some of the agents they've expressed concerns that well we they don't want the top producer who has so many listings to blackball them or um, not present their offers however the consensus was that regardless of whether or not you report them, they're still not going to present your offers anyway. And um, what some of the associations are doing is that they're trying to gather um, a bunch of agents from different companies. If they have enough uh, agents from outside companies who are not related to each other, who are uh, writing up these unethical agents, then the association has more support to go through and um, and talk to this unethical agent. Um, also, I wanted to let you guys know the BRE is on high alert regarding pocket listings and whether or not it, it is a breach of duty. Um, pocket listings are a lawsuit waiting to happen, and the idea of a clash, class action lawsuit is being discussed. Uh, your license is not worth uh, risking. Uh, I also wanted to discuss with you guys um, on the Realtor Action Fund Committee. Last year's fundraising goals were met statewide. Um, the 2014 goals are to raise $1.75 million um, in funds. Currently, they've raised 1.725, so they're very close in obtaining their uh, fundraising goals. And they also want to increase voluntary contribution to reach 10% for each region. As an association, back in 2012, we had 8% of our members participating. In 2013, only 7%. So you can see that we're already declining, and this year we only have 1%. Now, why is it important to contribute? Uh, the Realtor Action Fund, they support realtor-friendly candidates. They make sure that good laws regarding property rights and home ownership is passed. And also, um, 
they want to also, you know, it adds value to you. It, it's a higher proposition um, as far as values um, for you as a member because you're supporting home ownership and it protects livelihood. Uh, our region as a whole, uh, between us and Citrus Valley, Citrus Valley, we're Region 16, we have 100% CAR director co contribution, but like I said, as a membership as a whole, we only have 1% of our members contributing. We also had trustees from uh, CREPAC providing a, just a general report. I know some of our members, we feel that, you know, we want to close the gap between us and our clients because our clients don't know what it means to be a realtor and what we do to protect uh, property rights and home ownerships. So what CAR has done is that if you go on to um, CAR.org and under government affairs, you can, there's publications for you to distribute to your clients. This way they know what you're fighting for or what you're lobbying. Um, and I, our legislative committee is also going to be working towards um, um, having an event in the future to bring up our numbers. Uh, ideally, our goal is to be at least 15% membership participation. Thank you, Teresa. Yay. Our next CAR director will share her information with us is Sil Rudar. Sil is a member of the Transaction and Regulatory Committee at CAR. She's also a member of Membership Committee and Investment Housing Committee at CAR. She's the uh, regional rep for the Investment Housing Committee. Sil? Uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, there wasn't anything on the Investment Housing Committee that took uh, action. But the one thing that they did have is they had a policy paper about the wood destroying uh, past. How many of you use the WPA form in your transactions? Raise your hand. Okay. Things are going to change drastically as of November. The WPA is not going to be there anymore. They're taking it out of the library. Here's what's going to happen. Your listing agent should advise their seller to get their termite report up front. Now, is that going to happen? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we will not have a WPA to be able to protect the buyer. It will be in the fine print along with the other reports that are suggested that the buyer procures. So, once you write the offer and you ask for a copy of their pest control and they say, I don't have it, it's up to you to get it. Now the buyer has to pay the whatever fee to the pest control, and I wish I saw a pest control person here at the, at the meeting, but I don't see one. They're gonna have to, have to get their own pest control person to do the inspection. Probably an $85 fee or a $100 fee that the buyer is gonna have to pay. Now, my cousin works for the pest control company, and my cousin's going to give me a really good report and it's probably going to be twice as much as what the seller could have gotten had they gotten the report. Now in my offer I'm going to say I need to have all of this repaired because the physical inspector brings out in their reports check with a certified pest control company. How many times do you see that in your physical inspections? Now, the lenders say, if you don't put it in your offer, the lender doesn't ask for it. But if the physical inspector notes it, and the appraiser goes out there and notes termite damage, guess what? It's got to be done. I just had one where the termite work was $8,000. Now, I represented the buyer. I knew there was termite work. And so I used the WPA and said that the seller was to pay for all termite work to be done on the house in the garage. Now, when we saw the bill for $8,000, which was 
14 days into the transaction of your 17 days to remove all contingencies, you now have a negotiation problem. What do you do? Who pays for it? Because there's nowhere that says in your contract now who's going to pay for this termite work. So I suggest very strongly that you as listing agents get that pest control work done ahead of time give it to the buyer with all the other disclosures that you have so that that buyer can make a wise decision in a timely manner as to what's going to happen. Now, we thought this at CAR, and here's the process. It comes to committee in a, in a form of a policy paper. We read, and we read the policy paper, we attend the seminar that is filled with hundreds of realtors from all over the state and we have discussion and half the room said we want to keep the WPA the other half of the room said no we don't it goes then to the standard forum committee the standard forum committee then discusses it then from the standard forum committee it goes to the executive board the executive board then brings it to the assembly where we now have maybe 800 realtors throughout the state making the decision. It was very controversial, but the decision was to remove it. Now, I don't like the decision. I don't think our area likes the decision. How many buyers are you going to run into where you say, well, we don't have any verbiage for this WPA. I'm going to have to write it myself. I'm not an attorney. I don't have the wording. The wording was in the WPA form. So here's what you can do. Get out your pens and paper, because here's what you can do as realtor members. You can contact car.org slash RPA 2014. You can see the new RPA form that's coming out in November and you can make comments on it right now. As of November, it's a done deal. You can complain to the fact that the WPA is being removed that you want it kept. At least keep it for a year so that we can go through this transitional period of not having that safeguard of the, ARC, of the WPA form. Okay, when you make a comment, Please enter your name, your association, and your Region 16 number. We still have a vote, but you need to speak up and complain that you want to have that form. This is the democratic process of CAR. Okay, the other issue I have is AB 1513. AB means in its assembly bill. Um, and this is only for properties in Palmdale and Lancaster. And if any of you have properties in these two areas see me, it has to do with vacant properties. There is a real problem in those two cities particularly because these vacant properties are being inhabited by unauthorized people. Then they have to go through the whole process of eviction in order to get these people out. This bill will get the people out in 48 hours. So it's a real boom. They're testing it in these two cities to see if it's going to work. You probably have um, issues here in these cities, but this is being tested up there. Watch, it will come to us. Uh, one other thing I want to note, is anybody talking about flood control on the panel? Okay. There was a big issue on flood control. They have, the uh, federal government has come in and laid maps all over the state of California of properties that are in flood control uh, areas. So flood hazard. Flood hazard, correct. Thank you. Some of those areas really aren't flood hazard areas in central LA or in Downey, or in areas where, you know, how are you going to have a flood control area on flat land? If you find out that your homeowner is being charged this
flood insurance at a high premium, a very high premium, you can have an inspector come out, inspect the land, and they have to do an elevation inspection to be able to see if it really is in a flood hazard zone. Most of the time when you have the inspection, you will find out that it is not, and then you don't have to pay the high fee. But this is something that we know that the maps are flawed, we know it's all over the place, not just in you know Northern California, but right here in our hometown. So if you need more information, let me know. Thank you, Sue. Next, I'd like to invite up here is Lee Lee Berg. Lee is our <coughs> government affairs director. He is also a member of legislative at CAR, a member of realtor risk management, consumer protection, right. and he's the regional rep for local government forum. Lee? Thank you. Ah, uh, I can't. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The time that I spent in San Sacramento and Washington reminded me of the famous quote by Gideon J. Tucker who said, no man's life, liberty, or property are safe while the legislature is in session. <laughs> <laughs> True. And we are going to focus on the property part of that saying. Uh, First of all, these were three issues, four issues that were at CAR. And uh, the first one, hopefully you can read those, but the first one, SB 1439 Leno, is Ellis Act restriction. Uh, what this is, is some time ago they enforced or they enacted the Ellis Act, and the Ellis Act made it so that if you bought a, a piece of property and there was a tenant in there, there was a procedure that you could follow to to retake the use of that property. If you were going to buy it and move in, or you bought a duplex and you were going to live in one side here, in-laws were going to live on the other side. So it, it set standards for for that procedure. Well, <clears throat> there's there's a 120-day notice if they're elderly or handicapped. There's a there's a 12-month notice. Uh, there could be fees associated with it. Uh, we, we deem it to be a pretty fair process. This would throw out that process and make it so it's five years minimum uh, that that tenant could stay in the, in the property. Uh, it, it's being tested up in San Francisco, which is kind of the, the camel's nose under the tent because everybody will presumably go along with it if it only affects San Francisco, but uh, they would like to do this statewide. So CAR is adamantly opposed to this one. The next one is AB 2416, and it has to do with wage liens on property. Uh, this came up last year, and we defeated it, and hopefully we'll be able to defeat it again, but it would create a super lien for wage claim disputes. So if you are an employer, and you have an employee that, that files a, a claim, uh, a wage dispute, they would then be able to attach a lien to either the, your, your place of business, or in this case, even your personal residence. Um, I'm sure our title people could tell us what this would do as far as affecting the title. It would work very similar to how a mechanics lien would work. Uh, it would supersede other liens with the exception of tax liens. So uh, there are other means that these could be vetted right now. There's channels that, that employees can pursue and, and uh, with uh, you know, due, due diligence, due recourse for the, uh, for the employer. So the third one is AB 2039, and this is, has to do with the auction companies. And one of the things that the auction companies have done is they've signed, they've, they've forced listing agents and sellers to sign a, a clause that says they won't hold the auction company liable for their mistakes. All we're trying to do, this is CAR sponsored one, all we're trying to do is to 
to make them accountable for their own mistakes. So if the auction company makes a mistake, don't put it on the listing agent. Okay. The fourth one is SB 30, uh, 391, and that is a recording tax, and we are strongly opposed to this. It would import, impose a $75 tax on the recording of all non-sale documents, including refinances. So if you refinance your property, you would have uh, recording fees. If you had to record the death of a spouse, you would have recording fees. If you are a plumber and you want to record a lien, a mechanics lien, there would be a recording fee. In fact, they said uh, in, in, in many cases it might be as much as the bill itself that you're recording uh, as, far as, as far as a plumber would go. If they're, if, or let's say it's a $225 fee on a $300 mechanics lien or, or you know, it just doesn't make economic sense. Uh, the, the way they're selling this is the money is to go for affordable housing, which we're all in favor of affordable housing, but we don't think it should be financed solely uh, on the backs of those who are, are recording uh, uh, title, making title changes. So, all right, thank you. Uh, the, the last one I'm gonna touch on is uh, at NAR. <clears throat> and at NAR, the theme was do no harm. And I think it's very appropriate because more than asking for things in Washington, D.C., we're trying to protect what we have, and we're trying to protect primarily the GSEs, Fannie, Freddie, uh, and FHA. We know that if these were to go away, uh, it would really create a lot of instability in our, in our financing and our availability of, of financing. So we're trying to preserve those. There's a lot of talk. Uh, in Washington right now about doing away with those. Uh, there's the PATH Act, which we think goes too far. There's some good things in it, but that has to be negotiated. And then uh, every year I'm up here, I talk about the mortgage interest deduction, and that's once again on the table. So the feeling, uh, fortunately, as, as Gideon Tucker would realize, is that nothing's gonna get done this year because we're in an election year and nobody wants to touch anything. So probably that means we're safe. Uh, next year, they'll, they'll try and get some things done early in the year. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the focuses is gonna be on, on immigration, and so that kind of leaves our issues out of it. But uh, we, we do know that there is a debate coming on income taxes and changing the tax structure, and that will certainly affect some of our, our property-related issues. So. If you have questions, if you want numbers or names or anything like that or more specifics, uh, please contact me either after the meeting or, or send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Our next speaker is Tom Berge, Jr. Tom Berge is a CAR director as well as an NAR director. At CAR, he's the vice chair of California Realtor Expo <laughs> and he is a member of legislative and a regional representative for MLS Policy Committee. Tom? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My goal is to uh, lose weight over the next year. I can barely get behind Lee there. <laughs> it's uh, good to be back home. It seems like I've been on the road for the past six months traveling back and forth to Chicago, uh, DC and Sacramento, but it's good to be home. I always feel uh, welcome when I'm here at West St. Gabriel and th this is uh, where my heart is. So it's good to be back uh, with you. Uh, as Lee kind of alluded to, uh, we're constantly under attack in both Sacramento and back in Washington, DC both at, in the, at the state level and the national level, they are trying to balance their budgets on the backs of the taxpayers. And the first people that they look towards are property owners, unfortunately. Uh, something, that inter something that I found out that was quite interesting, uh, I was selected to the NAR Leadership Academy this year. I graduated in Washington, D.C. this past week 
and one of our class projects for the Leadership Academy was to write a grant application either at the state or the national level that would either benefit the, the state association or our local association. I felt that I want, I want to try to do both. So what I found in the course of doing some digging is that our association, before I came and became involved, we have never had an RPAC fundraising activity ever, in, in, as far as I know, at our association. And we haven't had an RPAC committee or an RPAC budget. Last month at our board of directors meeting, when I brought this forward in the course of writing my grant application and, get, and submitting it to NAR, I uh, made a motion uh, to allocate $5,000 from our general fund uh, to, uh, to form an RPAC committee locally and to allocate $5,000 budget for the uh, effort. The grant that I wrote specifically for NAR, what I'm proposing to do, and NAR was very excited about it because the proposal is to have a, a walkathon which is going to be called the Builder Party. We protect the American Dream Walk. We're going to hold it at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Some of you, probably most of you, have been to the Rose Bowl and you know that we have the the exercise track. People use use it for different forms of recreation, cycling, running, jogging, walking, whatever. But we're going to utilize that and what we what we're going to do is we're going to collaborate with other associations. I think a lot of people and I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around here, I think a lot of people, myself included, have been a little bit confused by what an RPAC donation, what investing in RPAC is. Everybody pays $49 above the line in their annual dues billing statement. That's mandatory. Then some people, it's hard to get other people to invest above that amount because they think that the next level is the $148 level and I can understand that. That's a big jump to a lot of people. So a lot of people unfortunately are reluctant to, to move up to that amount, but that's not true. Anything in increments, you can, you can invest a minimum of $20 above that $49. If we were to get everyone in our association to invest $20 above that initial $49. I mean, how many people here go out to, out to lunch once a week or out to dinner once a week and spend, we'd probably spend much more than $20. I mean, I think that if, it, I'd like to see everybody invest $50 above the, initial, uh, above the initial 49, but if you can't do it, I understand, but I'd like to see everybody this year at the Realtor Party Walk that we're gonna have towards the end of the year, if everybody could contribute or consider contributing a minimum of at least $20 to our pack above that $49, this goes a long way in helping support and defeat the legislation that affects the housing market, affects our business personally. So you really, you're investing in your business and I think it's something that all of us should think about doing. I put my money where my mouth is. Yen Burr has two. Lorraine Clark were the three major investors from our own association. I'm, I'm contributing $1,000 annually to it. I've made a pledge nationally to contribute $10,000 over the next 10 years. So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. If I, I would be ecstatic if each of you later this year when we do have the walk would consider at least contributing 20 and maybe $50 to our pack, it would be great. Getting to the logistics of, of the Realtor Party Walk, so we're proposing to have it at the Rose Bowl. We still gotta work out some of the kinks. Right now the proposal is to have it on the 24th or 26th of October. We gotta work around the UCLA football schedule. Uh, Lee Lieberg, Luckily for us, is on the Tournament of Roses. He has been for years, so he's able to procure uh, tickets for the, both the Rose Bowl game and the, and the Rose Parade. So 
what we're going to do, we're going to have the walk. We have to collect the investments prior to going to the Rose Bowl. We're not allowed to solicit investments in the, in the public. It's illegal to do that. So we have plenty of time leading up to the event. At the, when we get to the event, people are going to walk. We're going to mingle. We're going to, we're going to get signs made, banners made that say the realtor party protecting the American dream. We think we're going to get, we think and NAR thinks that we're going to get a lot of exposure both locally and nationally because of the amount of people that we anticipate getting there. We're going to collaborate with surrounding associations. While I was back in Washington, D.C., I was to, had, had the good fortune of talking to some friends that are in, that are moving up in the chain that one of them is the president-elect of the Oklahoma Association of Realtors, another one's the president-elect of the Indiana Association of Realtors. When I told them about it, they were very excited. They both happen to work for Coldwell Banker, and as I understand it, Coldwell Banker's having a big convention in October at the Universal Sheraton, so that may be a moving target, the October 24th, 26th date. I may try to move that date up to October to allow them to participate because they said that they could get, they would bring hundreds of their agents to that because a lot of them have never even seen the Rose Bowl, so they want to go get the exposure. Anyway, getting to the, the real gist of it, so what, the person, the person that can, can procure the most investments, you can go out and solicit friends in your office, uh, whoever, it's got to be realtors. We're going to have one first prize. It's going to be called the, what do we say that it was going to be called, Lee? Uh, the, 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 uh, 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 anyway. Parade and game. The what? That's Tournament Rose is Parade and game. What are we, are we going to call it? Something really Stop. fancy. I just can't remember okay. the name. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the grand prize for the person that gets the the most solicit, gets the most investors to contribute to our pack at a minimum of twenty dollars will get a four, uh, the grand package is going to be four tickets to the to the Rose Bowl game and along with four tickets in with premier grandstand seating at the Rose Parade. The second place prize winner that procures the second amount of in, the second largest amount of investments will get two tickets to the game and two tickets to the Rose Parade with Premier City. We're also going to have eight third place prizes which will be a set of four movie tickets to the AMC Theater, to the Edwards Theater, it doesn't really matter, whatever your choice is, and that's a $50 value. And I'm sorry, backing up, it's a $1,200 value for the for the grand prize, which is the four tickets to the Rose Parade and the Rose Bowl game, and a $600 value for the two t two ticket package to both the game and for the uh, for the Rose Parade. I got a lot of stuff to cover. I can stand up here for now. Is it time? Yes. Okay. Anyway, and then uh, I have one other thing. I have a. a handout that's going around. I'm also on the Real Property Valuation Committee at NAR, and there was a lot of discussion there about appraisers out of the area. I know around here it doesn't affect us too much because most of the transactions are cash, but that will change over time, and we'll be going back to the conventional financing deals where we're getting out of area, out of area appraisers, I think I said agents before, that are coming in, don't know what they're doing, this handout, and I'm sorry I didn't have time to fold it up for you, but this handout will tell you some of the, the truths and myths of what you can and can't do with appraisers. And if you have questions about it, I'm also a state certified appraiser, please feel free to call me at my office or approach me anytime here. I'm always available and I'm always happy to talk to anybody about any of that. And I thank you for your time. One last thing that I gotta cover is the expo, since I'm the vice chair of the expo. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the expo, again, this year is gonna be three free days, three free tracks. How many people here went to the expo last year? Did, it, did the people enjoy it that went to the expo? Yeah. What about the buses? How, how, did people take the buses yes. down there? Yeah. Did you like taking the buses? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're proposing that we're gonna do that again this year. We'll know for sure next week when the Board of Directors meets, but the but the intent is to provide the three days, the buses all three days again.
please sign up now the early bird there as i said there's three free days of tracks there's some excellent tracks on uh, tuesday we have a really good speaker terry shodin uh, she's going to be presenting small message big impact how to how to build a persuasive presentation the uh, wednesday keynote speaker I don't need to tell anybody about any of you about this guy. He's the guy that landed the U.S. Airways jet on the Hudson. Uh, uh, Captain Ch Chesley Sully Sullenberger. I haven't seen him speak personally. I think Lee might have. He's supposed to be excellent. And then, of course, we'll wrap up with Leslie Appleton Young uh, with her 2015 economic forecast on Thursday and. I think it's going to be an excellent, I may be biased because I'm the vice chair of the expo, but I think it's going to be one of the best expos that we've ever had. And we've got some excellent speakers and excellent tracks, and I hope to see all of them there in October. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Now we have only two more speakers who will be giving us very, very brief reports. <laughs> Sorry, Susie. <laughs> The first one is uh, Susie Dunkel Soto. Susie is a member of Land Use and Environmental Committee. She's also the regional rep for this committee. She's also a member of Realtor Risk Management Consumer Protection and a member of Taxation and Government Finance. Susie? Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Good morning. So for Land Use and Environmental, Actually, let me just first say, it sounds like we went and had a great time in Sacramento, and we were there learning a lot, but there was so much. We were so exhausted when we came back. I had a wonderful roommate. <laughs> that made it, but, I mean, we were there on your behalf, and it was a long, intense um, meetings. Um, I had one on Friday starting at 6.30 a.m., and we finished ending meetings at 6.30 p.m. on Friday with the meeting Saturday morning at 8.30. So long, long week um, that we were there. On the, um, there were no action items on land use and environmental. On the taxation and government, there was one action item, and I'll just read it, um, that CAR sponsor legislation to amend the statute that requires private transfer fees to be recorded so that private transfer fees whose payment is not triggered by a change in ownership or that are not based on sales price are covered by the statute. So that was a motion that we uh, overwhelmingly was um, passed, carried. Um, the other was, I think that was all as far as action items for the committees that I was on. Um, the 6.30 meeting that I had on, that I attended on Friday morning, and I think Tom Senior attended, and Teresa. We woke up bright and early and fought with a shower. <laughs> I had two roommates that night. Um, the, um, the one item that came up, um, and crew, it's, um, the meeting was crew. It's California real estate expert, and it's an attorney, expert, expert witness. witness. Um, the attorney that spoke um, was probably about an hour and a half, two hours, of just citing a lot of issues that come up and that they're seeing a trend in. One item that was a, a big focus was the when a buyer acquires a property and the seller does a rent back, the buyer, oftentimes the buyer is purchasing the property as an owner occupant to occupy the property. Where if the seller's doing a rent back, they're kind of, it's lender fraud. They can't, so there's a huge violation. Oh, Teresa was there, she's helping me with my notes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, oftentimes we know, unfortunately, as we're rushing through and the lenders, everyone's going through, our buyers are just signing the documents without reading the fine print. So, um, that's something just to, to pay attention to when you're working with your buyers on a property that is a, a rent back so that they are not, um, there's no loan fraud or uh, any legal issues. But that's all I have for now. Thank you, Susie. Next up is Kevin Kwan. Kevin is a member of Realtor Risk Management Consumer Protection. He's also a member of Taxation and Government Finance and a member of YPN. And he's also a regional rep for Public Policy Forum. Kevin? Yes. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Kevin. So I'll be talking about public policy issues. Um, if you guys don't know what exactly that forum is, uh, the forum is designed to provide opportunity for education, information, and networking regarding uh, public policy issues that uh, that discussions in various public policy committees. Um, issues related to the public policy development for CAR at the greatest possible uh, extent not to overlap any non-policy forum. So this last meeting up in Sacramento, uh, we had auction companies come, or we invited a couple auction companies to come speak to us because that's becoming a bigger uh, role in, in the real estate world that we work in. Uh, you may have heard of like auction.com, HubZoo, um, Kennedy Wilson. We invited these three companies to come speak with us. Um, unfortunately, two out of the three declined. Um, but auction.com did send a representative to come talk to us and, and listen to what we have to say and answer questions from the floor. Um, so some of the insights that I learned about auction.com, uh, if, if a lot of you guys have probably worked with short sales, um, either whether you're on the buying side or the listing side, a lot of a lot of lenders are now requiring part of the listing, even if you already have an accepted offer with a well-qualified buyer, that they do have to put the property on auction.com for a specific amount of time. It's a tool that the lenders are using to verify that the offer that they have currently is the highest and best offer that the market would bear. So some of the downsides to this is you may have a well-qualified buyer um, and with the time that overlaps with putting the property onto auction.com, your current buyer may, one, also get outbidded in the process, and number two, uh, with the time that it's on the market, that buyer could end up leaving. So there, there are some downsides to that. Um, one of the other things that um, and I, I believe uh, Lee, Lee mentioned a little bit too, was with auction.com you do have to use their contracts and in their contracts it does uh, release them of any liability in the transaction and it puts all the responsibility back on the sellers as well as the agents um, some other interesting insights that i learned about auction.com is they consider this they consider themselves a marketing company they spend annually anywhere between about 30 to 40 million dollars a year to help sell their properties. And that's what they, they uh, kind of target on is giving the amount of exposure to, to their clients to sell the properties via their websites and the marketings that they, they put out. They operate as a traditional auction model company uh, where the buyers end up paying a premium. So if your buyer were to go on to auction.com, purchase a property, they're the winning bidder. Uh, typically they would have to pay a premium on top of whatever that they uh, ended up winning the bid at. So if, let's say if it's $100,000, there's a 5% premium, you end up paying $105,000 for the property. Um, other things that uh, was pretty shocking to me is they also have a shell bidding process. Meaning, if the, and, and a lot of times with, with the, uh, with the uh, sales price, there's a minimum reserve amount that they that they must reach. So with their process, if it's getting if it's not at that minimum reserve price, they have the right to go ahead and increase the next highest bid. So that would be equivalent to us if we had uh, uh, a client or, or, or if we're selling a property and we brought in a fake offer to increase the purchase price, right? Uh, that would be artificially increasing prices. So they have the right to do that in their contract, which would get them to the threshold that they need, need to get for the minimum reserve amount. Mm -hmm. So that would be completely unethical for us to do, but it's okay for them to do. So that, that was something that was pretty shocking to me. Um, lastly, I, I know we touched a lot about the short sales. That is a small percentage of their business is what they're saying. Um, they're focusing a lot on, on large transaction amounts, especially in the commercial properties. If you do REO properties, they are contracted with NationStar, so all the NationStar properties are on their websites for sale. And lastly, a really interesting fact is Google has just invested $40 million into this company, and they now hold a 4% 4 stake in the company, so um, that's something to kind of keep an eye out on. And that is my report. Thank you.
Kevin, and I'm filling for the shortest report for last. That's from me. I am the chair of the Education Services Advisory at CAR, and basically we just want you all to know that we still have that 12 CE units uh, free. So go online and sign up for the 12 units. Okay, that's it for uh, from me. So Jackson, and thank you, panelists, for sharing the information with our members.